This video is made entirely possible by my patrons, especially new producers Piero, Matty Conks, and Jacob. Find out more at the link in the description. Even if you don't know Neutral Milk Hotel's music, you probably know their reputation. The old, European-style album art depicting a girl with a thing over her head, sitting by the sea and pointing upwards into the distance. Singer and guitarist Jeff Mangum's surreal lyrics and manic singing. Bizarre, haunting instrumentation. This otherworldly concoction of sounds and feelings have helped their second and final album become a legendary figure within the music scene. In this video, I'm going to explore what makes Neutral Milk Hotel one of the most recognizable bands of the last 20 years. Let's learn more. Neutral Milk Hotel was founded in the small city of Ruston, Louisiana in 1989. It began as a recording project for singer and multi-instrumentalist Jeff Mangum, who would build up an extensive catalog of experimental lo-fi home recordings over the next six or seven years. Jeff moved across the US several times throughout the 1990s, working on various projects under the Elephant Six recording umbrella. These projects included those by cult figures in indie music, Apples and Stereo, and the Olivia Tremor Control, two bands made up of NMH collaborators and members. In 96, Jeff Mangum was joined by a couple of friends in Denver, Colorado for the recording of the first official Neutral Milk Hotel album on Avery Island. On Avery Island doesn't have much in common with the Neutral Milk Hotel we all know and love. It's a fuzzy lo-fi release that, while it hints at the greatness that would come out of NMH's later music, doesn't quite live up to the surreal bizarreness that would succeed it. The problem with Avery Island is that it lacks the compelling mythology that Aeroplane is based upon. All the pieces are there, but there's nothing to pour through in terms of greater meaning and backstory, which is what makes Aeroplane so special. That being said, there are moments within Avery Island that are some of the most powerful I've experienced in a long time. Jeff's desperate singing on April 8th, the crushing guitars on Song Against Sex, and the bizarre and overwhelming soundscapes that pop up throughout the record combine to make an album that's more than worth listening to. When Jeff once again returned to Denver two years later to record the next Neutral Milk Hotel album, he did so with a full band. He was joined by organist and drummer Jeremy Barnes, brass player Scott Spillane, and Julian Coster, a multi-instrumentalist that played singing saw, banjo, accordion, and more. While we don't know much about how the band made the album, In the Aeroplane Over the Sea quickly became one of the most highly regarded works of music to come out of the 90s. Listeners everywhere fell in love with the eclectic mix of Eastern European folk music, jazz, punk, and all manner of bizarre instrumentation. But what was even more spellbinding than that was the album's surreal lyricism, coupled with Jeff's manic singing voice. Lyrically, Jeff Mangum creates a collage made up of historical imagery, vague reflections on religion, and personal experiences. A lot of the songs feature themes of young love and relationships, shown through a lens of whimsical surrealism. King of Carrot Flowers describes the connection between two young people in love, contrasting it with the disdain involved in many dysfunctional adult relationships. Holland 1945 is a fast-moving punk song with mystical lyricism, depicting burning pianos, circus wheels, and the ultimately corruptible nature of reality. A strong sense of disillusionment runs throughout the entire record. There are all manner of different ways to interpret Jeff's cryptic words, and most of them involve a sort of tiredness of the disappointing nature of life in general. Jeff was strongly affected by the darker aspects of life, and much of the record is influenced by his idealistic visions of how things should work. He comes to terms with the toughness and disappointment inherent to all human relationships, even the human relationship with God. The eight-minute epic, O Comely, tells the story of an adulterous father through the lens of a child deeply disillusioned with her parents' immorality. The disorientingly powerful song ends with a return to the album's very central theme, the life and death of Anne Frank. Indeed, on a deeper level, most people agree that Aeroplane is about Anne Frank, a German-born Jewish girl who documented her experience hiding from Nazis in Amsterdam during World War II. In an interview from the spring of 1998, just a few months after Aeroplane came out, Jeff detailed what exactly about Anne Frank pushed him to the brink of insanity. He told the interviewer that while he was waiting to travel to Denver for the recording of Avery Island two years beforehand, he had recently been asking himself what he would feel like if he had immense historical knowledge. Would he lose his mind, or would everything make sense? 
The question inspired Jeff to wander into a bookstore and pick up a copy of the diary of Anne Frank. Legend says that after reading the book, Jeff flipped out and spent a lengthy period of time obsessed with her story. He spent days crying for the lost potential of her life, and experienced a recurring dream that he could go back in time and save her from her untimely demise. This theme runs throughout the record, making it a sort of loose concept album, though Jeff later dialed back on this. Um, I met Jeff about three years ago during the last few shows of the tour. I shook his hand and thanked him for basically shaping so much of my life with his music. We didn't have much time to talk, but I remember asking him what Aeroplane was about, Anne Frank, or a larger commentary on relationships and religion as a whole. In retrospect, I almost feel guilty for asking such a question, but his answer was more than kind. He told me that it wasn't about those things, and in fact, Aeroplane could be about whatever I wanted it to be. I'll never forget the kindness in his voice. He's just such a remarkable soul. In a way, this confusing, non-committal answer says a lot about Aeroplane as a whole. The album overflows with historical imagery. The instrumentation draws from rich and largely recognizable cultural traditions to instill within the listener a strong sense of familiarity. Its lyrics are all over the place, referencing history, religion, and a raw vision of the human experience, all while conjuring up a sort of collage in our minds while we listen. I think this is perhaps why Aeroplane appeals so strongly to young adults, and has served as a formative album for many of us. When we're young without much life experience, a lot of what we know and feel comes from things we've been taught. With his extreme emotional reaction to Anne Frank's diary, Jeff tapped into a universal aspect of growing up. Adulthood is overwhelming. With it comes immense freedom to do and feel as you please, at the cost of the comfort and security of childhood. This process extends to all areas of adulthood and maturation, be it physical security or mental. The reality of how fragile our lives are and how quickly they pass is overwhelming. If you think about it for too long, you just might find yourself in disbelief at how strange it is to be anything at all. Just a few months after the release of Aeroplane, Jeff Mangum stopped making music. He turned down an offer to open for a much larger band and disappeared quietly into the night. Neutral Milk Hotel regrouped twice in the early 2010s, briefly touring and releasing an EP of songs written in the mid-90s. But they would never put anything to paper after Aeroplane, much less return to the public eye. This disappearance only strengthened their reputation, but Jeff's reason for doing it was simple and unassuming. He had nothing else to say. At the end of Aeroplane's final track, we can hear Jeff gently put his guitar down and walk away from the microphone. Was he trying to tell us something about himself and life as a whole? We'll never know, but it can mean that if we want it to. Hey guys, um, this isn't scripted, but I just want to shill my Patreon really quickly. So I offer a bunch of different rewards that I think is actually a lot for the money. So if you donate $1, you can join the private patron only Discord server and you get a monthly behind the scenes blog posts talking about everything that happened with the channel and every video I've made. You also get your name in the credits of every video. For $3, I do like a, a monthly Q&A that's just open throughout the month. If you want to know anything about how I make videos or anything about me, you can ask me and I'll answer there. I also post the scripts for every video after I release them. And I have two things relating to playlists. I offer uh, a collaborative Spotify playlist where you can add any song that you want me to hear and everyone else can listen to it as well. Um, and I'll make you a playlist specifically tailored to your music taste, so whatever you ask for, I'll pick out the best songs and make that for you. And for $10, this is really the big thing. For, for the $10 reward tier, I kind of post everything that I'm doing while I'm making videos um, for you to give feedback on and just look at before it happens, so you're always going to know what I'm making. You're usually going to see the videos early, and you're, you're really going to get like a good look into exactly how I do what I do. You can also write your own short message at the end of every video, and you'll be listed as an executive producer in the credits as well. I'm working on maybe a, a, some more tiers, maybe a $5 or a $20 tier where I can offer maybe merch or advice for your own YouTube channel or whatever you guys want. I'm really open to suggestions. Uh, thanks for watching, and I will be back two weeks from now with another video.